So Chantry's book uh, deals, first of all, we'll just go from uh, chapter to chapter. And the first one is on preaching the character of God. So, and I'm going to ask questions. I know we're not used to this. And we don't do this. But if you wish to respond, you may. Um, what were, what were the positive elements of this rich young ruler when he first came to Christ? And if we looked at it at first, what were the positive elements? He eagerly came. That he eagerly came. He comes running. So that's his enthusiasm. What else? He himself by the right. He kneels. So it's, he's respectful. To the Lord Jesus Christ. What else? What's that? Zealous for the law of God. All right. What else? Seeking answers. What was it? Seeking answers. Right. He's seeking answers. He's asking, what shall I do? So he's talking about eternal things. And he's very complimentary to Christ, right? Very complimentary. He said, good master. What shall I do? Chantry in his book writes, Aren't you a little disappointed or perplexed to see Jesus handling this tender soul so roughly? So how did Christ begin dealing with this soul? What's he start with? Right? And he starts with a rebuke. What does he say to him? Why are you what? Why are you calling me good? I had somebody ask me this just the other day. I was out with a man, with professional services, a doctor, and he was asking about this very text, um, asking questions about it. So why does Christ rebuke that? Why does he rebuke? He's saying he's being respectful to Christ, and he says, you know, good master, and he starts out with this rebuke, um, what is, what's, the, what's the problem with him, with the rich young ruler saying, good master? Because he's flattering him, not seeing God, or Christ as God. So he's flattering him in the sense, and seeing him as a man only, and not as God. So <clears throat> even if he means it, he's still not seeing Christ for who he is. So Christ does not accept worship or accept compliments or accept anything from us when it is less than what it ought to be as far as our understanding of who he is. If we just understand him to be the great prophet or great rabbi in this day, he saw him as a great teacher, which he was a great teacher, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. So, and that's why the chapter uh, is described as preaching the character of God. Because what Chantry is saying is that it's important how we see God. And it's important how the soul that we're dealing with sees God. So, and in all of these things, as we work through these chapters and these lessons that he gives to us, it's not a five-step, okay, I got to do this first, and then I got to do this next, and then I got to do this next. I grew up with that. Plans are good. Steps are good. Sometimes you need it when you first start to help you just think through how you're going to talk to his soul. But what he's talking about in this chapter is discerning, discerning where the man is or the woman is in their understanding of God and the character of God and who God is. As Christians, especially if you're an older Christian, you've been around the faith for a while, we begin to assume things about what other people understand about God. What we think are the most simple things about God, we assume they should know that or that they will know that and that they will accept it. And that's what I think Chantry's telling us. It, that can't be assumed. That can't be assumed. He writes, an evangelist today must know what it is to be committed above everything else to be glorifying God. So Christ... Christ, obviously, through this whole process, he's not interested in getting a convert, okay? 
this is part of the problem with the teaching of evangelism in many churches, and I grew up with a lot of it and through liberty with it. It was getting the convert. It was bringing the fish in. It was, you know, adding to the number of souls. And, and many of them had good, good you know, they, they meant well by it, but some of it was, was really not helpful at all. So the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned first and foremost not actually with uh, this man's soul. What's his first concern? What's Christ's first concern? What would we say? Bringing honor to God. Bringing honor to God. Glory to God. So, and by bringing glory to God, it is a concern for this man's soul because actually... If your first concern is the glory of God, then the way you communicate to other people in your personal evangelism is going to be helpful to that soul. It may not bring the soul in right away, but it will inform the soul as to what is the most important thing in life. And for you, if the most important thing in life is the honor of God, then that's the way you're going to approach communicating to other people and to other souls. You're not going to fret over whether or not they like what you think about God. Because it doesn't matter what they like concerning God. They need to know and understand who God is. So he talks about uh, Jesus and Paul explaining who God is. And uh, in some of their preaching and teaching uh, in their own ministries. And that the idea of I want you to accept Jesus as a personal savior. It's a phrase that's used a lot. And actually there's nothing wrong with the phrase, but it can be abused. So what does Chantry say that this idea of a personal savior might mean to the unconverted soul that you're dealing with? What might he think when that phrase is used if he doesn't really know who God is? Say that again. Right, insurance card. He's kind of our genie in the bottle. He's our personal savior, mine. So personal savior is a beautiful phrase, actually. Schaefer uses it a lot in that true spirituality that we're looking at tonight. He talks about a personal God, and it's very, very true in opposition to the Hindus and others who have a God who is just out there and is not personal. But in the way that it has been used at times, it's been unhelpful unhelpful so <clears throat> he preaches the law to this man why does he preach the law to this man what is he trying to make this man aware of his sins obviously what about his sins is he trying to make him aware of right that he stands before a holy judge the enormity of his crimes, how great his crimes are. It's easy for people to agree, as he said, in general about sin. A lot of people will agree that there's sin, and yeah, and, and, but their understanding or view of sin oftentimes is an imperfection. It's not necessarily the breaking of a law that deserves a judgment and a punishment and a condemnation against the holy God. It's a whole different idea that they have in their mind about sin. Sin is a mistake for a lot of people. Um, and we all make mistakes, and none of us are perfect. We hear those phrases. Every time I hear the phrase, well, none of us are perfect, I, I always want to say, wow, what a profound thought. How long did it take us to get that? How long should it take us to get there? The problem with the evangelism that has ha- we've had in this country at times is Picturing God as a God who's wringing his hands, wishing and hoping that somebody would just accept him, that somebody would just receive him, and that his plan, he went through all this, and and now people are not accepting him. And so we have to help God. We have to make God more acceptable to men so that they'll accept God because God's up there concerned and worried that he's not going to accomplish all of his holy will concerning salvation. And it's a very grotesque, terrible picture, actually. Of God, But a lot of us grew up with that mentality in our churches. So yes, we, are, we have to understand that God is a holy God. And as 
uh, Chantry says, he's angry at the sinner at this moment. His sword of wrath already hangs over the guilty, like uh, Edward's famous sermon, and will forever torment him until he repents and trusts Christ. So, see, that's the other half of that. When, they, when the phrase was always put out there, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And then he's just seen as this genie in a bottle. What we want to add to that is, uh, but if you do not receive this Christ in repentance and faith, he will torment you forever and ever. Because he's not just one thing, is he? And I think that's our mistake, is to make God just one thing. Because we can go to the Bible and where it says God is love. That sounds like God is one thing. So if it doesn't mean he's one thing, what does God is love mean? Ask my resident theologians. What does that mean? God is love. How are we to understand that if we were not to understand it as this is what God is and only God is? Uh, we do understand that he is the source. This is a source of all love. If there's love in the world, there is that love. And as he is love, he is completely love and he is fully love in the most perfected sense of it. Our problem is, is whether or not we understand what love actually is. And when he is wrath, he is all wrath also, and he is perfect wrath, if we can understand what wrath is. So that in all the character and as aspects of God, he is not half of this and half of this. He is whole, all of this and all of this and all of this perfectly. That's how we understand God in his character and his attributes. All right. Page 31, I have written down, 31 and 32. What must I do? This is on page 31. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Ask the religious youth. You must apply to Jehovah for it. But before you rush into his courts, let me tell you, he is so holy that if any one ray of his glory were to meet your eye, you would be cast at his feet with a dreadful sense of uncleanness. Do you think you've done him a favor by accepting Jesus, quote unquote, the Holy One has done you a favor and commanded you to trust his son? So when we're dealing with souls, one of the things that can be helpful is the fact that God, we, we do believe in divine election and that God has a people and that people have been given to him so that we aren't trying to manipulate people into the kingdom. We are a part of the purposes of God in accomplishing all of his holy will upon the earth. And when we deal with the soul, and that soul has a wrong view of God, you know, what should we do? We should correct it. It's okay to correct it. It's okay to correct them. You see, because they need the correction, because you are the ones who know the word of God, have been around the word of God for a long time. You have, we may have no idea what the individual soul is. They may have almost no biblical knowledge or understanding of the truth. It is good and it is right to correct their view of God because that's one of the most important things for them to have is a right view of God. You know, it hits us in the face when Christ immediately bludgeons this guy about good and he says, why are you calling me good? Nobody's good but God. He's correcting him and he's making him think and he's surprising him with the statement. And so it's okay to surprise people. And so not, not in a high and mighty sense, not in an arrogant sense, but with the desire to glorify God and that they really have a right knowledge of who God is. So how, how could Paul say that he was free from the blood of all men? It's, it's, it's within that chapter as well. Paul said, I'm free from the blood of all men. How did Chantry tie that together with why? It's on page 32. Why, why could Paul say that? Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. I got the old book. Sorry. It's in the first chapter toward the end. Ah, Okay. It's inverted. I like numbers. I'm getting my phone off so I don't have to take any calls. 
while we're doing this. <clears throat> so what, how, how can Paul say that? He's free from the blood of all men. Because he had not shown to declare to you all the counsel of God. Okay, so that's how Chantry ties it. He was free from their blood because he, he had shared with them all the counsel of God. Not just a few aspects that we feel as though an individual soul might find acceptable as a plan to bring them into the church or the membership of the church, um, but to share with them all the counsel of God, who God was. All right. Chapter 2. Preaching the law of God. <clears throat> so how does Christ... Chantry said that Christ had already dealt with the first table of the law. What did he mean by that? Micah, what did he mean by that? That he had already dealt with the first table of the law. Giving God his due. Right. Talking about the goodness of God. Talking about God being alone good. So he had already dealt with that part of the law. So now he comes to the second table of the law. Um, and why is it? Generally, why is it important for us to help and share with people the principles of the Ten Commandments? How is that helpful in our bringing them the gospel? Well, first of all, is the law the gospel? No, it's not. The law is the law, and the gospel is the gospel. The gospel is the good news. The law is the holiness of God, which to the sinner is bad news. It's not bad news in and of itself, but it's, it's the holiness of God. It's, a, it's an expression of the holiness of God. So, so in general, what is the purpose of the law? Everyone knows this about. To bring about the knowledge of sin. Okay, to bring a knowledge of sin, to understand our sin, which is why it's not wrong for us to bring this into a conversation in which we are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. There has been a theological error that has gone around saying that now, in, in this dispensation, we do not need to have repentance, we just need to have faith. And therefore, we just preach faith in Christ. And we just preach the positive things about God's gift and God has redeemed you and God has, and we try to keep it on a positive level and, and this, is, this, again, is a problem with our society uh, in dealing with souls that we are afraid to offend or afraid to scare people. And, uh, but the fact is, is that there's both negative and positive elements to all of this. And without understanding correctly the negative elements, the positive really don't make a whole lot of sense unless you have a God who's a genie. So... He says the cross cannot be understood aright until you understand the broken law. See, we can talk about the cross all day long. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins. Jesus died on the cross to bring you to heaven. We can make these statements, and unless it's just magic, unless some of this is just some sort of magic, we don't really understand the legal basis by which Jesus needed to go to the cross. The cross is actually an awful thing, and it's an awful thing in that it shows how awful we are that this should be the remedy for our sins, that this should have to take place on account of our sins. So what are we learning about the law in the cross? Right, so there's an execution going on there. There's actually a punishment going on there. And there has to be a substitution there if it's going to help us at all. So Christ is not being punished on his own account. We know that because of another the aspect and character of God, that he is holy and without sin. And therefore, there must be another reason as to why he's there on the cross. And that reason has to do with the broken law, which is why it's important to preach the law of God. What are some wrong ideas about the cross that we need to dispel? The cross is a what? The cross is a martyrdom. 
Was the cross a martyrdom? Was Jesus a martyr? He wasn't a martyr. Been plenty of martyrs. None of the martyrs died for my sin. None of the martyrs could save me. It wasn't a martyrdom. Uh, the cross is not a loving gesture. It is a loving gesture, but it's not just a loving gesture. It's not just an example for us to show how we should love other people. He loved us so much he died for us, so you should love other people too. That can lead to even the whole idea of tolerating every kind of sin. The cross is an absolute necessity. Jesus, as Chantry says, Jesus was satisfying the just demands of the law against sinners. Now, some people, he, he notes, and he notes, I'm going to quit my pages here. He notes that the law and love are not irrevocable enemies. It's not the law and love and they're against each other. The law elucidates the demands of love. The law shows us how we behave if we love. If we love, we don't commit adultery and we're faithful. If we love, we don't steal, but we work with our hands and help others with our, with our goods. So the law of God is not against the love of God. The law of God actually expresses to us practical ways in which we love one another. So the rich young ruler had a knowledge of the law, but his knowledge was superficial. Uh, Christ says to him, Sell all that you have. Which commandment does Chantry tie this to? Yeah. Tenth commandment, to not covet. And I was kind of working that out in my head as I was thinking about it because it's talking about coveting another man's house, another man's wife, another man's... And I was trying to think how he was thinking through this and then actually listening through Schaefer's. Schaefer has a long thing on the Tenth Commandment as that the Ten Commandments is kind of a conclusion to all the commandments because if you break the Tenth Commandment, which is about desire, okay? It's about desiring. Desiring what is not your own. And he says if you, when you break the Tenth Commandment, you've actually broken one of the other nine altogether. Whether you're stealing or whether you're not giving God his due or whether you're not giving God his day, and all those things, you're desiring to do something yourself which does not belong to you. So I agree with, uh, that helped me to understand some of Chantry's view of it as well. Now, how does he apply the 10th commandment? What, is he, what does he request of the young man? Sell everything you have. Sell everything you have. Because what was he pinpointing in that young man's life? What kind of desire was he pinpointing in that young man's life? The desire for possessions. The desire for possessions. Not just the desire for possessions, but the desire for an abundance of those possessions. He had, a, he had much, it says. And he wasn't ready to give that up. He wasn't ready to walk away from that. So... In other words, there was something that was preeminent above Christ. And this is what we're looking for, too, when we talk to souls. As we're talking to souls, we're looking to see who their love is. Who is preeminent for them? What is preeminent for them? What is, what is the idol of their heart? Because the demand is, is to count the cost, and all must be given up for Christ. This is not, I don't think that what... What he asks of this young man, commentators sometimes do somersaults trying to figure out how to apply that to us now. Well, you apply it to us now because the, the same demand is given to every soul that comes to Jesus Christ. The demand is, is that Jesus Christ is supreme in our affections, in our desires, and that everything else is his, to be his. And it may mean that we give up everything that we have. It may mean that we give up our very life. So this, this demand that Christ makes of the 10th commandment is something that comes to every single soul. So it's the way we are presenting the gospel to others as well. You know, it's not come to Jesus and God's going to make your life lovely 
Well, no, maybe come to Jesus and God is going to make your life a whole lot of trouble because you're going to have people that don't like you now and, and family that may not like you now and that all kinds of problems with having Christ preeminent in your life. So I think it's still the demand of discipleship that he gives. Chapter 3, preaching repentance toward God. What two things are necessary to know before we are ready to repent? Before we're ready to repent, what are the two things that we need to understand correctly? Our sin and God's holiness. Right. That God is a holy God. He is a God who rules and he is absolutely pure. And that the law of God is very strict. The law of God doesn't bend. It's there, doesn't bend. When you break it, you've broken it. And then there's repentance, metanoia. So what does repentance mean? What's the basic definition of repentance? Change of the mind. Change of the mind. What are we changing our minds about? We're changing our minds about God and acknowledging his holiness. Whereas before, the sinner maybe took God very much for granted. Now he changes his mind, he acknowledges the holiness of God, and towards ourselves as deserving judgment. We change our mind. Whereas we didn't really believe we were that bad or that we deserved judgment, we change our minds about deserving judgment. And we repent of whatever idol is in our heart that keeps us from saying, Jesus is Lord. So do we believe in lordship salvation? Of course we do. You can't have a savior without a lord. He has to lord it over death and hell and sin and the power of all these things. Uh, there's, no, there's no savior without a lord. So there's no way you come to the Lord Jesus Christ making some sort of bargain with him. <laughs> the bargain is you die and he lives in you. So that's the bargain. So the change of mind, Chantry goes over um, three things he gives. He says we have to reverse what? Reverse our priorities. God becomes the great priority of our life. Revolutionize our philosophy. Um, and turn from the idol whatever idol is in the soul. So the woman at the well, what issue of God's law did, did he deal with there for the woman at the well? What was the law of God he dealt with there with that woman? Adultery. Yeah, adultery, fornication, unfaithfulness. We're not told how she came about all them husbands and lost all those husbands but the assumption from the text as the Lord Jesus Christ deals with her soul is that there was sin involved in all of that business of all of those husbands. And uh, how about Zacchaeus? How did, what did he deal with Zacchaeus? Stealing. Stealing. And that's apparent. We're not told, he said to Zacchaeus, you've been a thief. But it's apparent that it was dealt with because Zacchaeus says, I'm going to repay he not only confesses and acknowledges theft, but he also makes restitution as well, which shows forth the work of God in his soul. And we can't always make restitution for our sins. So, you know, Paul had hailed men and women into prison, probably had some of them committed to death, and there was nothing he could do about that past of his. But he did devote himself to the furtherance of the kingdom in all things. So we have to get forgiveness. We need to get forgiveness. So we preach repentance. Jesus preached repentance. So all these people that say it's not for this dispensation, Jesus preached repent and believe. The apostles preached repent and believe. Sometimes the apostles just said, 
believe. Does that mean they did away with repentance? No, they're emphasizing belief. Sometimes the apostles just said, repent. Does that mean they were getting rid of belief? No, they were emphasizing repentance at that point. But it's obvious throughout the scripture that those two things, those two things were um, emphasized. All right. So we have to get people away from their general ideas about sin. They don't need general ideas about sin. You see some of the evangelists that you've seen probably clips of bringing men to acknowledge the fact that, have you ever lied? Okay, that means that you have committed that sin that makes you a liar. Have you ever stolen? Well, yes, I guess I have. Well, that makes you a thief too. So they come down to very specific things. Chantry says, if you tell your friends to confess sorrowfully, that would be simple. But you cannot ask them to, but you cannot ask them to turn from sins of which they are ignorant or to, uh, to an unknown God. Unaware of any particular law broken or a serious habit of sin, they would not know what to turn from. They are sorry to know that they may perish, but they are not distressed that they have offended a holy God. Indeed, they look upon sin as the inevitable slip of the creature who cannot help himself. All right. Go ahead. Right, right. He that covers his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesses. Right, exactly. Forsake. And forsake. All right. He also talks about the theory of the carnal Christian as an outcome of bad evangelism. So, Micah, give us an idea of what, what is the carnal Christian theory? Right. So they call them carnal Christians because they're acting carnally, not just now and then, but as a way of life. That's where we have the rub. That if a person is acting in a carnal fashion, living out a life of sin, disregarding, disregarding God, you know, not showing any care for the church, for the, for the Lord, then he's not a carnal Christian. He's just not a believer. Connie. How do you repent of original sin? Well, we repent of the sins we have. We can be, I'm not sure how we repent over um, original sin. Original sin is what we possess in Adam, that we have the reason we have a sin nature. We could be sorry for the fact that we have a sin nature and that we are exercising our ability to sin in that sin nature. That's what we repent of, I suppose. I suppose what we're repenting of is the fact that we agree with and practice what comes out of that sin nature. Um, when we are forgiven by Christ, we are forgiven for all things, for sins past, present, future. All things are taken care of in that time of repentance when we are brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that would be covered under all of that. So our, our, our original sin is, is what brings a man into this world a sinner because he doesn't, he doesn't become a sinner because he sins. He sins because he's already a sinner. He already has that sin nature. So... <clears throat> That has to be, and even that, Connie, is not when we repent and turn from our sins and we, we receive forgiveness, even that is not obliterated. That nature is not. But in the salvation of God, that nature will be obliterated when we die. 
that's when it's taken care of as far as the actual source of our sins. All right. Chapter 4, Preaching Faith. Preaching faith toward God's Son. Repentance and faith are Siamese twins. <clears throat> Which comes first, repentance or faith? Yes. They come together. They come together. We're not going to fret over that. How does this statement, preaching faith toward Jesus Christ, how does this take place? Well, how is it taking place in our text itself? Well, he gives there an invitation to come to Christ and to follow Christ. In, in all that he shares with this young man and in that section, and he said, and he was, uh, come, take up the cross and follow me. So there's come, there's an invitation to come to Jesus Christ take up the cross, there's an invitation to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and follow me, follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ in our sanctification as well. So he's preaching Christ in the sense, and, and not with a fullness here as it would be in other texts in which we get into justification, redemption, all the other words. There are other things obviously that can, and can be preached when we preach faith toward God's son. But within the text itself, what, he is, what Chantry is saying is that he's preaching Christ in the sense that this is an invitation to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow him, to listen to him, to obey him, to, and in the previous chapter to give up all in order that Christ might be preeminent, that he might be preeminent. It's an invitation to die to self and to imitate Christ in obedience. All of it preaches Christ in his work and in his mission, his work to justify men, his mission to glorify God. And one of the quotes in that chapter was that the narrow gate is the beginning of the narrow way. It's a good quote. The narrow gate is the beginning of the narrow way. So we come in in a narrow thing, but we, it, it's a narrow path we stay on as well. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. What do we confess when we confess the Lord, when we come to Christ? What do we confess? What was it? Did I hear it? Yeah. If thou wilt confess with your mouth the Lord... Jesus Christ, Kurios, Lord, Master, Jesus, Jesus, the Savior, Christ, the Messiah. That's what you're confessing. You're confessing his Lordship, his Saviorship, his Messiahship when you come to him. So it is a confession, therefore an understanding of something of these things. We don't have a full understanding of any of these things, but we have enough of an understanding to understand we submit ourselves to him as a Lord. We look to him as a savior, and we believe upon him as the Messiah, as the only one who can save us, who can save us. He writes in his book, this fellow sincerely wanted eternal life and would have cheerfully invited Jesus into his heart for that gift, but Jesus was not waiting for the man's invitation to enter his heart. Christ was, Christ was making the terms I will give you eternal life if you come and follow me. You become my servant. Submit your mind to my teachings. I am the great prophet. Bow your will to my commandments. I am your king. Only on these terms do I offer salvation or life. And once again, not saying that it's based upon uh, how good you become suddenly, but what he's saying is the way we come to Christ is we bow. We bow. We come low to come to Christ. Discipleship is the terms of salvation. He invites you to come in the posture of submission. Our Lord Jesus Christ was fully honest with the rich inquirer. And that's our goal. Our goal is not how many souls can I get saved? 
We want to see the Lord save souls. We want men to be saved. But the goal is, is to deal honestly with men's souls. And I think that's one of the primary teachings of this little book. Be honest with other men's souls. If you have been honest with that person's soul, then you are successful. You are successful in what you have done. Our Lord Jesus Christ was fully honest with the rich inquirer. He plainly asserted following was going to involve a cross. Take up a cross, the instrument of pain. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. He assured his disciples. The, the young ruler was informed at the beginning that obedience to Jesus would call for discomfort and sacrifice. In addition to turning away from the chief delights of his carnal lusts, he must give up much that is legitimate as far as God's law is concerned. Friends would be lost, anguished hours of self-examination, prayer, discipleship is costly. Discipleship is costly. So, and at the point of salvation, it is basically just you see God for who he is, you see Christ for who he is, and he is so glorious and so great and his salvation is so great, he becomes everything to you. You don't always know what all that means or what discipleship is going to mean exactly, but you know this, that Christ is everything to you. All right, headed on the wrong thing here. Lastly, preaching the assurance. Preaching the assurance or acceptance with God. What assurance did Jesus give to the young ruler? What assurance did he give him? Okay, he gave him no assurance that anything had happened, did he? He gave him the assurance that if he would come to him and bow to him, that salvation was there. That's the assurance. How does false evangelism give false assurance? And he goes through these steps. And I'll quickly go through it. I know we're late. By repeating a prayer stating, thank you for coming into my heart. Repeat this prayer after me. Now say, thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart. And so we're putting words into people's mouths and, uh, and trying to give them assurance by having them state these things with their mouth. And then telling them, some people would tell them that it's a sin to doubt. It's a sin to doubt your salvation. Don't doubt your salvation because that's a sin. Well, actually we are to examine our hearts is what the scripture teaches to see that if we're in the faith. It's not a sin in the sense of, okay, I'm, I'm going to transgress against God. It could be a sin if we are, are looking to something else. But we need to be careful in hedging people into our little box of salvation that we have created for them. If they themselves haven't done business with God, if they themselves are not assured by God. Where does assurance come from, basically? What does he say? Who is the agent of assurance for the Christian? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If God gives you his Holy Spirit, then you will be given assurance that you know God and love God. Can, that, can, you, can doubts enter into the Christian mind? Sure they can. Yes, they do. Atheistic thoughts can enter into the Christian's mind. But he will fight his way out of that because it's a fight of faith. So he will fight back against those things, and he will not stay in those things. So we do not have the natural ability in and of ourselves, without a work of God to just repent and take God at any time we want. Men don't have that ability. So that while we're doing our sharing of Christ with others, we should be doing it with the full sense ourself of the sovereignty of God and that I'm talking to this soul. Faithfulness is to tell them the truth about God, but I don't have the power to change their lives. Jesus looked about and he said to his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter in the kingdom of God? They were astonished at his words. He said, children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. So, while we're sharing the Lord with other people, 
We don't have to feel guilty if we haven't brought them in, we haven't made them saved. We are faithful to tell them the truth, to be honest to them about their soul, to try to discern their souls. It was hard for me to come out of my plans. because I had my plans. I was in Philadelphia, we were working the plan, and we went through the plan with every door we went to until we met one door and the lady said to us, how long did it take you to, to memorize that spiel? As she had quietly listened to our spiel. And we sat down on a curb on the side of Philadelphia and said, we need to do something better than this. We need to actually find out where these souls are at. So we even know what to say to them, what to share with them. What is their view of God? What is their view of sin? And we don't have to get it all done in a day. We don't have to get it all done in a moment. We don't have to get it all done in, in one interview with them. We can only do what God has prepared them to at that point and to take them as far as we can at that point as far as their soul is concerned. And we can have the calmness to believe that God is in charge of this business and that God will see to it uh, that he, he will send forth his spirit to regenerate souls and to bring them to life. We just need to make sure that we're honoring God in it. All right, thank you, Father, for uh, this time and for this book that we have had to think about uh, personal evangelism and sharing our soul with others' souls and help us, Lord, uh, to apply these things uh, to our witness. And may you give us great peace and joy as we witness your greatness to others. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.